and we're absolutely delighted to be able to welcome uh, one of the nation's foremost authorities on, on, on uh, the affairs of the former Soviet states, uh, Professor Robert Legvold of Columbia University. Uh, Professor Legvold uh, is a graduate of uh, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He uh, taught at that institution for almost a decade, rising to professor of political science. He uh, headed up the uh, program on Soviet studies at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York for half a dozen years. He went to Columbia University. He headed the Harriman Institute there, uh, famous for its uh, Russian and European efforts, and has been on that faculty uh, until the present time. His publications are impressive. His short curriculum vitae is impressive, which I won't repeat the, uh, in its entirety. But uh, his recent publications indicate his interests. He's uh, uh, written on Belarus. He's written on security questions, which some of the, for uh, Russia's security questions with, uh, in relation to Europe and the Atlantic, with some of the foremost authorities in that area. And he's focused upon the large questions of, of uh, the future of, of the Soviet states after uh, the collapse of the Soviet empire. Uh, one of the books which he co-edited is From Empire to Nations. And he also has uh, addressed the, the concern of, of uh, uh, collapse, revolution, and uh, uh, rebuilding, uh, reconstruction uh, in the former uh, Soviet Union. His expertise, obviously, is on the international relations of the former Soviet states and uh, their relations with Asia and Europe and with the United States. And uh, some of you no doubt noticed his article on the uh, Russia's uh, unformed foreign policy, which appeared in Foreign Affairs this last fall. Professor Legvold serves on the uh, uh, Board of Trustees of Tufts. Uh, he serves on the Board of Trustees of the Carnegie Foundation for International Peace. And he's an advisor to the most distinguished of uh, organizations in the United States and abroad, which uh, deal with the questions of the future of the former Soviet states. So we're fortunate to have a truly distinguished authority on the topic uh, join us this evening. It's my pleasure to present Professor Robert Legvold. Dr. Bird, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the introduction. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm very impressed. Uh, rarely do councils on foreign relations that I know in Chicago, Cincinnati, New York, Boston, elsewhere turn a, out a crowd of this size. It's also a pleasure to be with you on this beautiful waterfront. Uh, although I teach at Columbia and have been in New York since 1977, I continue to live in Boston, and I commute between Boston <laughs> in New York. I hope that as we come out of the big dig, uh, we do as well as you folks have done around here. Uh, when I came over this evening from the hotel and walked by the Constellation, I was reminded that we have more in common than this question of what's going to become of our waterfront up in Boston, uh, because we have a similar boat that sits in our harbor. Uh, we also have two rather sad baseball teams. Uh, <laughs> And we have two Super Bowl champions, which I'm happier about. So it's a pleasure to be, pleasure to be with you. I know that you've had several programs uh, since September 11, appropriately so, because the world has been fundamentally changed by those events. We know it's been changed enormously within our own society. And we certainly sense that the larger world has also been altered. I think we're still taking inventory. I think we're uncertain whether we are uh, at the uh, bully pulpit in Washington as president and chief of our government or whether we are citizens or observers along the way. We're not quite sure. But an important part of that almost certainly is the transformation that began to take place after September 11th in U.S.-Russia relationships. Uh, 
Uh, I think everybody senses that an important change has occurred. My own view is that indeed it is a watershed in U.S.-Russia relations, and one that creates an enormous opportunity for recasting the relationship fundamentally. Uh, and to begin sorting things out fundamentally in this now post-Cold War period that we have uh, stumbled through for the last 10 to 12 years. In order to understand what changed after September 11, however, one has to spend a moment or two thinking about what the condition of U.S.-Russia relations were, uh, was before September 11th, and as part of that, what the condition of Russian foreign policy was. Uh, one of the primary emphases in what I have to say to you tonight is on the Russian side of the U.S.-Russia relationship, but on both of those. First of all, in terms of the condition of U.S.-Russian relations, they were not in good shape. From the mid-1990s, there had been a general deterioration in U.S.-Russia relations. And after the financial crisis in, the, in, in Russia in August of 1998, there was a particular acceleration in that deterioration. I would have characterized the relationship toward the end of the Clinton administration as one in which both powers were frustrated with the other, in which both powers saw the other side as more essentially the source of the problem than the solution to the problem, whatever it was, where we were beginning to, indeed we'd moved quite far toward disengaging from dealing with the problem of U.S.-Russia relations, in part because it required too much political capital for a return that the administration couldn't uh, measure or couldn't identify. I was struck by how much things had changed in the two terms that Bill Clinton served in Washington. I remember that first year when he put Russia at the very center of his foreign policy, and at the end of the year when he claimed enormous success for that foreign policy, it was an important part of the way in which he took the measure of himself as president in foreign policy and the claims that he made for the administration. He finished his second term uh, and his would-be successor, the vice president, Albert Gore, by doing everything possible to bury the issue of Russia and keep it out of an election because of its potential consequences politically in that year. After he left office, this problem of disengagement, and it was going on both sides, the Russians were reciprocating. Uh, after he left office <clears throat> and the new president came into office, there was a hiatus in which the new Bush administration spent very little time thinking about Russia. And the comments that began to come from the administration were highly critical, comments that the Russians were indeed the source of the problem of nuclear proliferation, not merely uh, a player that we needed to work with, but indeed a source of the problem when it came to their sales to Iran and so on. And when the Russians complained, the essential response was, let them stew in their own juices. They're not important enough to deal with. But somewhere along the line, things began to change. And in June, you'll remember that uh, President Bush met with Putin in Slovenia, and they hit it off well. It wasn't by accident. The president, before he went to Slovenia, had made a determination that he was going to treat the encounter the way he did, that he was going to look into this man's eyes, and he was going to see the Russian soul. Uh, and he was going to portray the relationship in the positive way in which he chose to do it. It wasn't clear to me at that point that it represented a substantial change in U.S. policy toward Russia as much as it represented a change in the way in which the administration was going to handle the Russia angle. And my view was that in that meeting, down through the meeting at Genoa, later in the summer, the essential stake that the Bush administration had developed in the Russia relationship was as a tool or an instrument for pursuing other aspects of the foreign policy, not in order to get serious about what the core issues were in U.S.-Russia relations. My view was that the Bush administration had decided that they needed Putin in order to deal with the new chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a man named Joe Biden in order to pursue the objectives they had on national missile defense, and in order to deal with obstreperous allies that might not be willing to accept the American unilateral approach to national missile defense and nuclear weapons, unless Mr. Putin was willing to sell, sign off on it and pull the rug out from under that opposition. I think there were some other instrumental stakes, if you will, that the administration had. Now, I will admit, after, since given the changes since September 11th, that probably is selling the administration short, that there was a hope that uh, indeed they could put the relationship on a somewhat different footing, persuade Mr. Putin, the new Russian president, that there were 
good reasons why Russia should be interested in having an alternative kind of relationship. Indeed, in the area of nuclear weapons, a relationship that more or less went in the direction that the administration wanted to take the strategic nuclear regime, that is, toward national missile defense and toward alternatives to what they saw as the old mutual deterrence or the mutual assured destruction relationship that we'd lived with during the Cold War. Uh, so I may overstate the point, but I think it was essentially correct. In terms of Russia, and the second point, the condition of Russia foreign policy, uh, the article that Dr. Byrd referred to in Foreign Affairs was published before September 11th, and the title was indeed Russia's Unformed Foreign Policy, because I believed that Putin and those around him were essentially adrift when it came to making decisions at a fundamental strategic level. That is, with whom are we going to be? Are we going to, in the long run, tie our fate to the West, including the United States and its institutions with the West, NATO, and so on? Or are we going to tilt at times, maybe even in rather durable fashion, with China? Or are we going to, uh, are we going to uh, play the game alone, essentially as a, what might be called a fortress Russia? that focused on its own region within Eurasia, allies like Kazakhstan and Belarus and so on in that area, um, and played the game in those terms. At that point, that is through the spring and the summer, I thought that the Russians had no answer to that question because I thought they didn't have clear answers to the still more fundamental questions of for what purpose in order to focus on what in foreign policy because they were confused about the world they lived in. For the most part, the foreign policy elite in Russia then, and I think even today, here Putin has broken with them, the foreign policy elite is basically mistrustful and unhappy about the realities of the moment. The realities of the moment are an utterly dominant United States. The realities of international politics are American primacy. And the Russians, for the most part, have instinctively been unhappy with that idea. And they've made common cause with the Chinese, who are also unhappy with that idea. So they celebrate the notion of a multipolar world, which is more a wish than it is an objective analysis of what we have. Uh, but the question was, how do you respond to, react to, deal with, counteract? undo American primacy, which was not within their kin, not within their power or their ability. The second basic source of uncertainty was what's the nature of the world that we live in in terms of the priorities that it creates? Is the nature of the world one that's dominated by all of those economic features that parade under that broad, fuzzy label of globalization? Or is it still a world in which military balances and alliances like NATO and nuclear weapons and military disadvantage and the use of military power are critical so that we really ought to worry about the enlargement of NATO and bringing it closer to our borders? We really ought to worry about the way NATO behaves in the Balkans and Kosovo or not. They weren't certain how to weigh those different phenomena in international politics. Uh, and as a result, while there was some coherence in Russian foreign policy, I thought it was essentially at the tactical level. They set priorities, and Putin's priorities emerging were very much in the economic sphere. That figured as a central item in virtually every one of his many trips, and he was a real globetrotter that first year, uh, from Canada to North Korea, from South Korea to, um, to Cuba. Uh, and uh, Austria, Germany, uh, Sweden, uh, virtually every area he traveled. And in all of those conversations, whether he was in Havana or whether he was in Seoul, economics was very important to what he was doing. Secondly, there was an emphasis on improving Russia's position within the former Soviet space and influence within the former Soviet space, doing it primarily by economic rather than military means. Uh, but not in a particularly kind or gentle fashion. They were using economics, including, including the power of Gazprom, the issues of debt, and a number of other things in a rather heavy-handed way in order, to, in order to increase influence within the post-Soviet space. So you had coherence at that level, the tactical level. Along comes September 11th, and overnight, Putin turns all this upside down. It was utterly out of character. The way in which he had been leading up to that point was essentially finding lowest common denominator, not intervening with any bold decision, attempting to be everything to everyone, uh, 
and being what some of my Russian friends who were critics of him at that time called the PR president without much substance behind it. Uh, so after September 11th, the fact that he within hours got on the telephone and provided the first major support to the United States after the event, in effect, got on the telephone and threw Russia's lot in with the West in this dramatic fashion and then followed it within a few days with specifics, and those specifics came in two forms. First of all, a pledge of all assistance, which was, there were, there were four or five, but the key, the key were two. The first was full intelligence sharing, and the Russians have shared intelligence, including military intelligence, in a way in which nobody in the American intelligence establishment ever dreamed would happen in the context of this war. The second thing that they did was agree to support the Northern Alliance because they were the major material suppliers. We've been paying for some of those T-55s that went to the Northern Alliance, but the Russians supplied it, and they've also provided a certain amount of technical assistance or military guidance to go with it, and then have cooperated in a number of other things, such as the effort to break up the financial network internationally uh, and a host of other things. He pledged that right from the beginning. But the key is that he threw Russia's lot in with the West on this issue. Why? Why did he do something so uncharacteristic and so out of tune with what everybody else around him was advising? Uh, virtually everybody that I talked to in Moscow and everybody that has been around that decision, when I ask them, on whom did he rely for advice, they say one person. And I say, who's that? And they say, Putin. There was nobody else that he, he, he turned to for this decision. Um, Grigory Yavlinsky, the leader of Yablika, um, says that within a day or two of this decision on September 12th, uh, probably the decision by the end of the day on September 11th, though there are eight hours difference, uh, he called together the 21 leaders of uh, parties and factions within the Duma and sounded them out on what should be done. He hadn't yet announced the specific support that, I'm, that I described for you a moment ago. Uh, and of the 21 who were in the room, Yavlinsky says, one person said we should ally with the Taliban. Two people said we should, throw, we should indeed back the West, the United States and the West. And the remaining 18 said we should be neutral. We don't have a dog in that fight. He listened to them for a few moments. He said, no. He said, I'll tell you what I'm doing, and then explained what was going to happen. So it was very much Putin and very much out of character of what we had seen before. Back to the question, why? I think the explanation is twofold. I think there is a narrower, specific, and lesser part of the explanation, which is also emotional, and that too is uncharacteristic of this fellow because everybody who's been around him or met him sees him as a very cool individual who's very unemotional about the political decisions that he takes. But there's one area where he's emotional, and that's Chechnya. And I think Chechnya was an important part of that almost reflexive reaction in the afternoon for him on September 11th. Because in his own mind, he sees Chechnya as genuinely a part of the struggle against global terrorism. He'd been talking about Chechnya as an issue of global terrorism, stretching from the Maghreb to Indonesia, and those were his phrases, for months before September 11th. And I think either consciously or at a minimum subconsciously, he saw September 11th as essentially a vindication of himself on Chechnya, and he was willing immediately to reach out to the president to say, I'm somebody who was here even before you and I'm prepared to support you because this is everything that I've been saying it's all about. That doesn't mean that he is so simple-minded that he fails to understand us when we say to him, or the Europeans, but Chechnya is not just about terrorism. It's also about nationalist groups that resist what you Russians have done in Chechnya over time. He knows that's the other part of the problem, but he believes that the core of the issue remains this much broader network that uh, includes links to al-Qaeda and to uh, radical Islamic uh, extreme or extremist is Islam, violent Islam uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the larger setting. But the more important part of the explanation, I believe, is that he recognized September 11th as an opportunity. I don't mean in a 
uh, I don't mean in a narrow-minded or a cynical fashion, far from that. I think he recognized that some of the things he was, in fact, entertaining before September 11th now would be possible. What I had underestimated in that Foreign Affairs article that I referred to a moment ago was the degree to which some things were beginning to turn over in his mind and his willingness to begin entertaining another way out of the deadlock over national missile defense, to entertain some compromises over the ABM agreement, for example. Unfortunately, he came too late to the idea that, yes, we ought to try to reach some compromise that would amend and change the ABM agreement and allow the Americans to go forward with national missile defense. And yes, he was beginning to say economics is important enough so that we need to find some way out of the NATO deadlock so we can go forward with cooperation with the West. But I don't think that he had any yet understanding or any conviction about how he was going to be able to do that. And I don't think the Bush administration had yet persuaded him that it was going to be feasible, that it was going to work out for the reasons that I described. But seven, September 11th persuaded him now it would work, and work not the least because for the first time in more than a, a decade, the Americans needed the Russians. Uh, before, all of these ideas turning over in his mind were from a Russian position of weakness. What would cause the Americans to reciprocate in any substantial way? But after September 11th, he understood that the Americans again needed the Russians in order to deal with what was now the central issue of American foreign policy, which was the struggle against uh, global terrorism, catastrophic terrorism. Uh, this, I believe, produced a historic opportunity. I use the word watershed at the outset. I think that significantly underestimates what was created for us by this decision on Putin's part after September 11th. It is a chance first to, as I said, recast the U.S.-Russia, the Russian-Western relationship fundamentally. And secondly, it is an opportunity to sort out the problem of Russia's basic orientation at this historical juncture, where Russia is going to be. All those, fundamentally all those fundamental unanswered questions that I referred to um, at, the, at the beginning. Uh, first of all, I think the, uh, in terms of the shift on the part of Putin's, uh, on Putin's part that creates the opportunity I've just described, is a readiness to deal with American primacy, that problem of American predominance in international politics by cooperating with it, which is something that they weren't prepared to choose or he wasn't prepared to choose or couldn't afford to choose before that time. Deal with the problem of American primacy by cooperating with the United States. Uh, and secondly, in that uncertainty about what kind of world we live in, is it a military world with many of the traditional problems of military balances and alliances like NATO, or is it a world of globalization, and now a world of globalization that has both that uh, powerful, often positive side and that ugly underside, which we saw on September 11th, and he decided it was globalization, both on its economic positive side and on its negative side of global global terrorism rather than these other kinds of issues. Uh, so the issue of orientation, I think, in one sharp swing of, uh, of that decision-making sword uh, was resolved in this fashion. More concretely, when it comes to the issues that had bedeviled the relationship and that we were backing away from not really wrestling with in its last, in the, in the, in the phases before September 11th, national missile defense and NATO enlargement, he was prepared to deal. Uh, in the case of national missile defense and its link to the broader strategic nuclear balance, he was ready to do what I call a three-legged stool. He was prepared to accept the American program in national missile defense uh, if the Americans were prepared to either amend the ABM agreement, uh, do it by amending the ABM agreement but keeping it, so that the treaty remained in, form, in force, or alternatively, negotiating an alternative framework, but one that would be in treaty form, so that there'd be a contract. He was willing to do either of those things by September 12th, September 13th. 
and he was, it was ready to be put on the, uh, on the table. Uh, the third part of that stool would be a very major reduction in strategic nuclear weapons because the Russians, whether we agree to reductions or not, as a result of simple attrition, are going to be down to below 1,500 nuclear weapons in the future. They won't be able to sustain a program any larger than that. Uh, so it was important to him that the American program come down one way or another. Those were the three legs to the stool. In the case of NATO, he was prepared to back away from this uh, resistance to NATO crossing the red line, that is, coming across the border of the former Soviet Union and enlarging to include the Baltic states. We were moving toward Prague of this year, 2002, and he knew that after the President's speech in Warsaw in June last summer, that the Americans were likely to move in the direction of, uh, of not simply the two S's, Slovakia and Slovenia, but something more ambitious in terms of enlargement and was prepared to put the NATO issue behind if the Americans were prepared to negotiate an alternative version of NATO so far as Russia was concerned. If the Americans and the rest of the NATO alliance were prepared to think about, on top of the current existing traditional NATO of its members with the NATO treaty, of a superstructure that would be essentially Russia with NATO, he, for a period of time, you'll remember from the newspapers, sounded as though he was interested in getting an invitation to join NATO. But he very quickly moved away from that. And that was not what he was looking for, an invitation to join NATO, either now or prospectively, but something that would be politically credible within his own political environment. And instead, he was interested in a framework by which Russia would, as an equal with all the other 19 members of the NATO alliance deal with an agenda that would be different from NATO's traditional agenda, which is security for Western Europe and then new missions in the Baltic, or in the Balkans. Uh, and he had in mind as the new agenda things like this global struggle against terrorism, dealing with weapons of mass destruction. So the agenda would change and you'd create this new mechanism. The way in which he thinks about the deal that was done in 1990 around the Founding Act when we brought the Czech Republic and uh, Poland and Hungary in was that it and created this so-called permanent joint council where the Russians do meet with NATO is it's essentially an arrangement of 19 uh, against one the way the Russians see it because the NATO 19 form a common position and then the negotiations begin with the Russians from a Russian point of view uh, which is not entirely fair because they haven't really tried to make much of the PJC. Um, it is 19 against one. They were looking for something that would be 20. Uh, I was with the American ambassador to Russia last night, Sandy Verschbau, uh, who's been, he was our ambassador to NATO before, so he's been working this problem for 12 years. And you will hear a new phrase um, before long, which will be the phrase about the 20. There may be also a new acronym, which will be R RNAC, like Russia and the NATO Atlantic Council for this new mechanism, which probably will be put in place by the May summit of uh, President Bush in Moscow. But the Russian phrase for that is from the Russian word for dvadsat, which is 20. Dvadsatka is what they call it. And they mean the 20 as a substitute for the 19 against the one on a new agenda. And he was prepared to move in that direction immediately after September 11. At that point, uh, I was very optimistic about what was going to happen in U.S.-Russia relations. As I say, a historic opportunity for recasting the relationship and for consolidating a basic choice about Russia's underlying orientation. Uh, I thought at that point that from the signs that the Bush administration was quite willing to reciprocate and quite ready to seize the opportunity uh, in its fullness. And it looked to me as though they recognized what had happened and they were prepared to capitalize on it. And I thought the first step in this direction would be the Crawford Summit in, in uh, mid-November, Washington and then Crawford Summit in mid-November. Uh, I recognized that the opportunity presented a very difficult conceptual problem, and it's one that people haven't even begun to wrestle with if we're going to go forward with this. It's something that um, 
that I don't think we've thought about as academics or as academic analysts in international relations and foreign policy before. Because essentially what the task is, if we were to seize this opportunity, is solve a, a problem that's unusual. The problem is how do you integrate Russia with the West when you can't integrate Russia into the West? Because always, as with the victors over the vanquished at the end of the Second World War, Germany and Japan, or with any other major enterprise among the great powers, concerts of Europe's or whatever, uh, it involves an integration into institutions. But there's no way that Russia is going to come into the institutions of the West. It's not going to come into NATO. It's not going to come into the European Union. And yet it is prepared to be aligned with or lined up with, cast its lot with the West. So how then do you integrate it with the West when you can't integrate it into the West? And I don't think we have begun to struggle with that problem not only in policy circles, they'll be the last to struggle with it, but in our circles on the outside in thinking about it. So I knew it was not going to be easy, uh, but my optimism began to turn to pessimism at precisely the point when I thought we would see the first successes, that is the Crawford Summit. And it may seem odd to you, but the reason why I began to become pessimistic at that point was precisely what many people saw as such a positive first step in this direction, and that was the President's announcement in Washington before going to Crawford that we would unilaterally reduce strategic nuclear weapons uh, from their current levels to, at some point in the next decade, between 1,700 and 2,200 warheads. Uh, I didn't like that notion that it was going to be done unilaterally because it, it meant that the administration was continuing to say we're not going to design this regime with the Russians. We're going to design it ourselves and we're going to ex in invite the Russians to join the regime in this fashion unilaterally. It was coupled with this notion that we are not interested in treaties, we're not interested in contracts, and we don't want to go through all the haggling and the de delays and all these other problems. Let's just get it over with. We'll do it unilaterally. If you think it's a good idea, you do it, but that's your business. Uh, and since we're no longer enemies but for friends, we're going to do it with a handshake. We're not going to do it with a contract. Now, I assume there are some lawyers in this room, and I assume many of you don't do business in contracts only among enemies. Uh, and the Russians didn't quite understand that concept. They wanted a contract. And Putin went to the ranch in Crawford with the assumption that he still wanted a contract. He was willing to renegotiate ABM, but he wanted, in the end, an ABM contract. He was prepared to think about an alternative to the ABM agreement, but he still wanted a contract at the end of the day. And then other things followed subsequently. Uh, within a month of that summit, that summit was November, the key point, point dates were around November 16th. De December 13th, the president announced that we are unilaterally going to abrogate the ABM agreement. We're not even going to make an effort to continue negotiating a revised contract. Uh, in Russia, in the public, in the press, this was seen as a very major slap in the, in the face. The Russians uh, can capture the, our phrase, slap in the face, in a single word, which is Paschochina. And Paschochina was all over the Russian press two days after December 13th. And then within a few days, um, well, I need to go back a step. In November, uh, Tony Blair, and then subsequently Consequently, uh, Robertson, the Secretary General of NATO, had indeed, Robertson had gone to Moscow with an idea for an alternative framework that looks like what I call the 20, this new mechanism with a new agenda, and put it to the Russians, and Putin was quite enthusiastic about it. But within a few weeks of what I've been describing, we had a NATO ministerial, by which time the Pentagon had caught up with these ideas and didn't like it. Not the least because Robertson had unfortunately used the phrase that the Russians would have a veto in the context of the 20, which is a foolish way to put it, because even NATO's 19 is a consensus. It's not an issue of a veto, so it was the wrong language. But it alerted people in Washington that didn't want to move down this path, that this was not something we wanted. So they really pulled back from the idea. Uh, doesn't mean that it's done. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. But there were a whole series of things that happened at that point that looked as though uh, the administration was not going to be very energetic in seizing this opportunity. I happened to be on uh, 
a, a television program a few weeks before that when I was very optimistic, and I was on with a colleague of mine who always has a cloud over his head, and he was being pessimistic that night. And the phrase that he used when I was talking about all the possibilities that I thought we'd begin to see realized at Crawford was, in fact, that it's essentially one hand clapping. Uh, and by December, that phrase from this colleague of mine, one hand clapping, was beginning to, beginning to echo in, in, my own, in my own mind. Part of the problem, it seemed to me, by December was, uh, was, uh, was two, twofold. First of all, uh, it looked to, to me, I, don't misunderstand me when I say this, because I'm, I actually celebrate the fact itself, but the effect, I think, is, as I'm about to describe it, the war was over too quickly and too easily uh, in terms of U.S.-Russia relations, because whatever leverage Putin had or thought he had after September 11th had very quickly dissipated with that, that success. Uh, we needed the Russians less in the urgent and immediate sense. Depends on how we think about the long run and the sustained struggle against terrorism and these other things, then the Russians continue to be of some importance. But I feared that if the opportunity was not seized, that I'm describing for you, that then it would go a glimmering. And my fear was that within a year or so, what we would see is the relationship thrown back to a pre-September 11th period. That is, a relationship that was marked by frustration on both sides, an unwillingness to engage one another, a return to a kind of disengagement rather than the re-engagement that President Bush had begun even before September, uh, and uh, where, uh, where, in fact, we would be essentially suffering from a negative synergy among the issues that divided us. They sort of become cumulative, and they begin to overcome whatever impulse or desire there is for cooperation. That's essentially what had been happening in the last five years before September 11th. <clears throat> and that in, the, in Russian foreign policy, you would get a reconfusion or a, a, a renewal of the confusion at that most fundamental level, maybe coherence at the tactical level, so what might be described as renewed tactical clarity or tactical coherence, but strategic ambivalence and strategic ambiguity on their part, uh, playing the field, not quite knowing where they were. Uh, it was hasty pessimism, and I was wrong. At least at this stage, I think I was wrong. Uh, it turns out, from what's been happening in the last several weeks, that this is not an opportunity that can be lost. It can be squandered. That is, we can fail to maximize its possibility, but we can't, I think, at this stage lose it. Or at least it'll be very difficult to lose. Uh, we've seen in the face of each of the steps that I've described, the disappointments at the Crawford Ranch, the announcement that we're going to unilaterally abrogate the ABM agreement, the announcement or the behavior of, uh, of the U.S. at the NATO ministerial in November, and then add to that a decision that was taken in January in which we announced that, well, after all these weapons that we're reducing, and we're not going to get to that 1,700 to 2,200 until 2012, not the 2,000 to 2,500 that um, Clinton and Yeltsin agreed to in 1997. In 1997, by 2007, we were going to get to 2,000 to 2,500. 1,700 to 2,200 was now set for 2012, and that was a date that could slip. But the point I'm about to make is, and the majority of the nuclear weapons, as they are taken off of their launchers, the nuclear warheads, are going to be put into an active stockpile. They're not going to be destroyed. Russians didn't like that idea, so that was still one further thing. In the face of every one of these issues, the Russian leader, Putin, reacted with a kind of coolness rather than reacting angrily condemning the Americans, he more or less set it aside and said, we've still got uh, a critical agenda that we want to move forward with. And even when much of the rest of the world after the State of the Union became enormously upset about axis of evil, he too, again, took it with a kind of uh, equanimity that you're not finding on the part of, say, the French foreign minister, Vedrine, or the German foreign minister, Jaska Fischer, uh, 
who have been openly condemning the U.S., but if you read Putin's interview with the Wall Street correspondents three days ago, you'll notice he says, well, I think it was essentially as a product of American domestic politics. Uh, let's see whether or not they're really going to do something. Uh, we would not favor it if they did it, but let's not lose our heads. Uh, so his reaction has been, as I've said, equanimitous. Uh, and I think, I think what's below that and what was beneath the, the developments that underlay that decision September 11th that I hadn't recognized adequately at the time is a chain. The first part of it is that I think uh, Putin, while he seeks partnership with the United States, has made his peace with the idea that it's going to be a junior partnership. He knows that the Russians are going to be the junior partner, and he's prepared to live with the idea of junior partnership. Moreover, he's prepared to live with a junior partnership because he is at last reconciled with American primacy. And rather than that angst and anger and frustration that circulate so powerfully in the veins of the political elite within Russia, he himself, I think, has come to terms with American primacy. And he has come to terms with American primacy because he's now reconciled with the meaning of Russia's weakness, rather than whatever pretense or efforts at creating virtual power or claims that are without foundation in terms of Russia's capacity to influence the outside world. And for a second reason, because his priorities are now more clearly in ways that support making peace with American primacy. They are economic priorities. They are getting into the WTO. They are securing investment from the outside world. They are making Russia a part of an international economy. And he can't afford to continue pursuing in this context, if you're prepared to accept Russia's weakness at this other level, ambiguity or uncertainty at this, at this most fundamental level. Uh, and as a result, I think Russia today is in essentially the same boat that our European allies are in. There's an enormous amount of grousing and discontent with the way in which the United States is conducting and using its primacy in international politics. But there is neither a capacity nor a willingness to challenge the United States in any fundamental way. There is no assumption that any of these powers, whether it's, a, whether it's a France or whether it's a Russia, is in a position to reject the United States or turn on the United States. Instead, what each of them will do, and I think Russia will not be much different from the French on this score, uh, is two things. One, they will attempt, where possible, to reduce their dependency on the United States, especially in the security area and there are going to be limits to how far they can go in that direction. And the second thing, they will attempt to avoid being commandeered by the United States for purposes that they don't agree with. They will not easily be commandeered into bringing down Saddam's regime in Iraq. But that is operating within a basic framework in which they're not in a position to align against the United States. And in this respect, today I believe Putin's Russia is no different from France on that score. Uh, uh, the final point that I would make is that, um, well, before I leave this last point, I think in effect then what Putin is saying as a positive rationalization for all of this, which you can see stems very much from a matter of making peace with Russia's weakness and addressing these other priorities, he is, he's saying in effect, I'm going to work a different agenda with the United States, the West, and the outside world. And in effect, what he's saying is that agenda that I began to describe in the context of the new mechanism with NATO is indeed the new agenda for Russian foreign policy and a new basis by which he's prepared to continue working with the United States as a junior partner. It includes, first of all, the struggle against counterterrorism. And as I say, this is a high foreign policy priority for Putin and was before September 11th. And he knows that this is a genuine basis for cooperation with the United States. Secondly, what they've begun talking about, and you see signs of it in the Wall Street Journal interview, but there's been much more in other contexts, is uh, creating as a basis for cooperation with the United States and the West international energy policy. Uh, the Russians are major exporters. I think they are the key state among the non-OPEC oil exporters. And for the most part, they have defined their interests in the international energy markets and oil 
as being consonant with the interests of the industrialized democracies rather than with the oil exporting states of OPEC, which they think is a dying institution in any event. And Putin's argument, both in the Wall Street Journal article and in several, in a, in a couple of other occasions, has been we, at a time when you're worried about reliable supply out of Saudi Arabia, can become an alternative reliable supplier. Uh, and secondly, we also have an interest in uh, ensuring that oil is not uh, priced at a level. We want 20 to $25 a barrel, but not priced at a level where industrialized market economies are jeopardized. And third, we are prepared to work the issue of uh, weapons of mass destruction which is an extension of especially the way the administration is defining the issue of terrorism, and several other things. And that's our agenda. And there's no reason why that can't be a basis, even if we are a junior partner. Let me finish, then, by saying what I see as the risks in this and what the meaning is of squandering an opportunity that you probably, that we're probably not going to lose. The opportunity will be there. Uh, but what are the what are the potential what's the potential price we pay for not doing as well as we might do? There are three that I would point to. The first is that many Russians, indeed, I think most within the Russian political establishment, not the public, but within the Russian political elite, including the foreign policy intelligentsia, the parliamentarians, even most of the bureaucracy that serves Putin within the government, and not just the military and the security forces, but even the foreign ministry, are not reconciled to those things that I said he's reconciled to, reconciled to American primacy. They still have, first, deep mistrust about the way in which the Americans are going to use their primacy, including the way they'll use it to affect Russian interests. And secondly, they are still interested in horse trading, and they expect that if Russia cooperates with the U.S., the U.S. will deliver in return. He has from the very beginning, September 11, said, this is not a horse trade. I'm not in this for bargaining. These are fundamental interests. We're going to pursue this agenda, and we're not going to keep score of who's getting what for what each step of the way. But much of the foreign policy elite would not agree with that. They are looking for quid pro quo. They are looking for payoffs. Uh, and therefore, it'll be a basis by which they judge the success of his foreign policy. Ambassador Virchbau, uh, I referred to this, uh, this session uh, a night ago, uh, made that point. That is, the administration recognizes that there's a limit to how far they can simply go their own way without delivering for Putin. It's one of the reasons why Powell, uh, Secretary of State Powell, in his testimony uh, two days ago or three days ago, said there will be a contract. We are prepared on the issue of reducing nuclear weapons to go beyond a handshake. We'll do some kind of a contract. Maybe it'll be an executive agreement, uh, but there'll be something formal. And that'll be worked out, I think, unless they fall on their faces out of diplomatic clumsiness on both sides, Moscow and Washington for in time for the May 23rd summit. And Putin will make of it what he can politically. Um, the uh, second concern that I, but the, to finish this point then, there are, the, Putin is operating alone. Uh, he has some people who are sympathetic with what he's doing. They don't happen to be in positions of influence and power. Uh, and that, even though he is president, he's very powerful and he's made some su substantial changes, has its own perils, depending on what the overall political environment is. The second point is that I think there's a danger that the old world that we knew, even the old world before 1989, 1991, is capable of um, reappearing. I'll give you some illustrations in the case of the post-Soviet space. Part of the problem during that period when I said we were allowing frustrations to dominate our hopes, we were moving toward disengaging from dealing with the core problems, um, and we were seeing one another as more the source of the problem than the solution, was in the post-Soviet space itself the, um, the re-emergence of what I would call strategic rivalry. The Soviets, I'm sorry, the Russians were in no position to compete with the United States as basic rivals on a global scale. They were much too weak. But within the post-Soviet space, the Caucasus, Central Asia, with Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, they are not uh, utterly weak in comparison to the United States. And the way in which they were seeing U.S. policy during that period of time was increasingly as a rival, whether it was in terms of pipelines and the politics of pipelines, 
or whether it was the way we were doing partnership for peace exercises under the auspices of NATO, or our bilateral relationship with Ukraine, or our developing relationship with Karimov's Uzbekistan even before September 11th, they were seeing this as a coherent strategy for rolling Russia's influence back within the post-Soviet space, and they were doing what they could to counter it. I used to argue with them it was a figment of their imagination. American policy was not that coherent in the post-Soviet space. But they were seeing it uh, in their own Rorschach test in this fashion. Uh, the risk is that while that problem of potential strategic rivalry in the post-Soviet space could easily be set aside if we would seize this opportunity and attempt to build cooperation, there is the risk that we may get the opposite. Because out of this war, we have done something rather extraordinary. We have militarily backed into Central Asia. We have 1,000 troops from the 10th Mountain Division now, stated, now stationed in Hanada Base in Uzbekistan. That comes with a quasi-mutual security pact that we signed with Karimov in Uzbekistan in October, saying that in the event of a crisis, we will consult. And in general, in the context in which we say we are beginning to assume responsibility for stability in Central Asia. The way Tommy Franks and Rumsfeld and others see it, it's essentially a resource in the war to the south in dealing with Afghanistan over the long run. But we are now in Central Asia in the midst of all of those problems. We have 200 uh, construction workers who have just arrived in Manas base in Kyrgyzstan, the next country. We're going up to 2,000 troops in Manas in Kyrgyzstan. The French are there. Uh, the Italians are there, the Canadians, the Australians, um, so out of that group, a sizable number of NATO troops. We're going to put 40 aircraft into Manas base. We're looking at bases in Tajikistan. We are now militarily in Central Asia. Across the border in Tajikistan is the 201st Mechanized Division that was there, the old Soviet division, now Russian division, that participated centrally in the Tajik Civil War, and that also assumes that it has responsibility for security in Central Asia. If we don't manage the relationship well, and we begin to get negative factors so that we're back to this issue of strategic rivalry in the post-Soviet space, we've now escalated to a new level. So we've got a choice. Either we work things out so that we work together in Central Asia to deal with instability, and there are all kinds of bases for instability in Central Asia, including those parts that intersect with China, the problem of, of the Uyghurs within Xinjiang, that western province of China. Uh, so it's the old world. These are problems that anyone who studied the Cold War or the problems in the early period after the Cold War would recognize as the old world. That could recur if we are inadvertent, if we inadvertently deal with it or neglect it. And then finally, uh, the third, I think there is the risk that by failing to fully exploit the opportunity, not losing it, but squandering it, by failing to fully exploit the opportunity, we will not in good time head off some dangers that I think we ought to see down the road. We've assumed that for the most part, as we've talked to the Russians about national missile defense, the AVM agreement, we'll work out things in May, that we've more or less managed the U.S.-Russian nuclear relationship. But since it's a re regime designed essentially by the United States, and we intend to continue to maintain it essentially by the United States, almost certainly what we're doing is beginning to widen what will become new phases of nuclear competition that will be shaped by two things in the next 5, 10, 15 years. The first will be the rise of China as a genuine power and the degree to which it chooses to become a major nuclear power in the process. And it will be the Chinese that are the principal respondents in this context, not the Russians, even though the Russians are the ones with uh, large numbers of nuclear weapons. More significantly, in this world that now is populated with Indian and Pakistani nuclear powers, and a China whose future as a nuclear power is uncertain, will be the process of militarizing space. Uh, and we're in the process of moving in that direction very rapidly in ways that nobody has yet begun to focus on. One of the items in the defense budget for this year is the deployment, not the development, but the deployment of a kinetic energy ASAT weapon. That's an offensive uh, weapon in space, uh, and it is the American intention to control space. 
Um, other countries have intended to control the seas. They've intended to control land masses in the past. Um, what this will lead to in the long run is uncertain. But it's clear that the way we're going about managing the U.S.-Russia nuclear relationship at this point is essentially precluding a more foresighted management of the nuclear relationship with all the players that will count in the new dimensions within the next 10 to 15 years. So I think there are costs, I think there are risks to squandering as opposed to losing this opportunity. And they, in the end, remind us, this is, brings me back to September, 11, uh, September 11th, how much of the old world and the dangers of the old world are still with us. Thanks very much. We are going to have to adhere to our, our normal deadline. Uh, I'd like to, because this has been a rare feast, uh, thank our guest so much for sharing his time and wisdom and understanding with us. My pleasure.